Okay, so this is the last segment about Blado momentum theory. We've covered the main theory, but there is a few important things that we need to consider here. And these all relate to correcting the airflow data. So it turns out, if you recall, one of the steps, as we said, CL is a function of alpha and you know maybe also Reynolds number and Mach number, right? And those have to come from some other method but this is actually critically important that this data is, is accurate. In fact, kind of the accuracy of blade momentum theory hinges on the accuracy of this data. Um, and it, often the data we get, so you run you know, this uh, panel code or you grab this data from wind tunnel or some data that's posted on the internet, most of the time you cannot just use the data as is. And there are a few reasons for that. And, and the biggest one, most important by far, to talk about is that rotation, the fact that this is a rotating blade as opposed to a stationary static airflow case changes the lift and drag behavior. Okay, the other are Reynolds number, Mach number, right? And uh, I'll, I'll briefly touch on those. We kind of mentioned this last time, right? That uh, Either we can provide for those upfront, maybe we have this type of data because we're doing simulation and so we can create this three-dimensional spline, but oftentimes we don't, especially if it's from wind tunnel data. So we may need to add some corrections for that. Um, another important thing that's not often considered is extrapolation or not thought of upfront, but it's important for this method is extrapolation. So, especially with wind tunnel data, you're just gonna get a relatively limited range of angle of attacks. And if you're doing this panel method that we've discussed in class with the integral boundary layer, we know that method is not really applicable once I have any appreciable separation. So again, I have a limited range of angle of attacks I can go to, but often, especially for a wind turbine, but sometimes for repeller, I'm gonna be operating with parts of my blade that is gonna be post-stall. So I need that type of data. and especially again for wind turbine, I often am looking at very odd inflow angles, right? Where the wind could be coming from different directions. So my angle of attack could be quite large. I need to be able to handle large angles. Um, even during the solution, as I'm doing this root finding method, it makes things easier if I can uh, handle a wide range. So for, especially for wind turbines, we go out from minus 180 to 180, right? Any angle. For propeller, we can get away with a narrower range, but still we usually have to extrapolate at least a little bit beyond what we can get from normal airflow data. And the final consideration, what's a bit more advanced, I'm only really gonna mention is dynamic stall. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about each of these briefly. Uh, first, rotation. Okay, so the physics actually here is pretty complex. I'm gonna oversimplify it a little bit, but to, to give you uh, and in part because we don't actually even fully understand all the mechanisms, right? And it really kind of depends on the situation. But here's sort of the main, some of the main things that are going on. Um, if you've taken a mechanics class and you've looked at things in a rotating frame of reference, you'll know that there are new apparent forces that exist. In fact, even if you haven't taken this class, you've at least experienced uh, kind of the centrif centrifugal force, as we call it. It's not really a force, it's, it's a, an apparent acceleration. It's an acceleration that occurs because you're in a moving uh, reference frame. So if you've been on like a, I don't even make these anymore because so many kids get hurt, but uh, I don't even know what they call them anymore. Those things that you spin around on the playground, right? And you get pushed out. They also have these at the, uh, at like an amusement park, right? Where you're in this kind of thing that's spinning and you feel yourself pushed to the outside. Um, I'm sure you've experienced that or you've taken something and spun it around and you know that it wants to, there's this force that's kind of pushing it out, right? There's a real tension on that string. This is, again, it's just the, if you take, uh, and this is derived in the book early on in the first chapter, if you just look at acceleration in a rotating frame, uh, these are just acceleration terms that occur, but often we move them on the other side of the equation as an apparent force. So we call this a centrifugal force. The other one that occurs is the Coriolis force. We don't usually uh, experience that directly as much, but we often talk about it in terms of weather systems because we're on a rotating reference frame, which is the earth. Uh, and we have, you know, wind speeds or, or air that's moving one direction because of the large scales, we do experience these Coriolis forces. Now on a wind turbine blade, most of the air moving over will not be affected by either of these to any significant degree 
uh, because it's just going too fast. But within the boundary layer or in a, in, a, in a separated region where the velocities are really slow, then because the air is moving so slow that this Coriolis force or centrifugal force does become important. Okay, and so one of the things that'll occur, let's say this is my uh, top view. Here's a top view. Okay, so here's, um, actually, what do I want to call this? This is not top view. This is a, yeah, I guess we could call it top view or back view. Let's say here's the rotation direction, omega. Um, I think in the book I call it a back view. So let's just call it the back view. So like I'm looking uh, behind my propeller or wind turbine, right? Uh, so it's standing up wind turbine or propeller and I'm, I'm looking at the back view. So it's rotating. So this side would be my leading edge. This side would be my trailing edge. Um, and, and let's look at now, here's kind of the edge view. Right, here's the edge view. So if I took that back view that I had, and now I look at it this way, right? So I rotate it, and I'm just looking here on the edge. So I'm looking right on this edge here, okay? Um, like a wing, we would expect to see some uh, circulation, right? Some circulatory flow, especially over the tip, but also it's gonna be happening around the hub. We get kind of this hub vortex, a tip vortex uh, that occurs, right? And so what that means is that along the wing, I get some velocity induced this way towards the root and this way towards the tip. And within the boundary layer or in the slowest part of the uh, flow, so this is say some flow that's moving in the boundary layer, I'm going to experience this Coriolis and centrifugal force. Again, I'm not going to drive this because it's in the book and it's a little bit lengthy, but the centrifugal, or sorry, the Coriolis force looks like this. It's a minus, uh, this is just the, the direction. This is not the full magnitude, but it's a minus omega cross V. So in our case, omega is uh, out of the page and V for this one is going to the right. So out of the page cross the right is up, but I have a minus sign, so that's gonna be down. So that means I get a parent uh, Coriolis force in this direction. And when I do the same thing uh, for this, this uh, velocity that's towards the tip, I get a Coriolis force in that direction. And if I was to do centripetal, which I'm not gonna do, uh, <laughs> That's one too many cross products for me to do, and we all know it, so but I'll write it. It's of this direction. Omega cross, omega cross, V, and, uh, or sorry, not V, R, so it doesn't depend on the V at all. And that's going to create something in this direction, right? This is my centripetal. I didn't write it because we all know it, right? As I spin, I get pushed towards the outside. That's the apparent force that I feel. All right, so what does all this mean? Well, what it means is that I get this apparent force within the boundary layer, this Coriolis force that is in this direction from leading edge to trailing edge. So it's a favorable pressure gradient, whereas on this side, it's an adverse. It's more pronounced here because this centripetal force kind of adds to the direction of this red arrow and subtracts from this one. So this kind of adds to that tip vortex that enhances this Coriolis force. And in fact, it moves the region over which this affects further along the wing or the blade. Whereas this one partially cancels this, so this is not generally as significant. This is a, a bigger effect here. So what happens is, kind of ignore this one, that I get this enhanced uh, favorable pressure gradient that kind of extends over a portion of my blade. Um, and so what that means is that the lift coefficient that I would have predicted from my static data, from my 2D airflow data, is actually going to be wrong. It's going to be delayed. So Let's say this is alpha CL. And if I go to the wind tunnel or I run my code and I get this kind of curve, but that's not actually going to be what's going to happen because of rotation. It's actually going to may, let's say, delay that stall somewhat. I'm going to have a different behavior. And that, especially again for wind turbines, because they operate near or post stall, even on parts of the blades, they're so big, there's such a wide range of angles. Uh, this is an important effect. Right? I can really change my predictions for thrust and torque. So I need to account for this. Uh, there are many models and I'll talk about lift first there. They generally follow a similar type of form and it'll be like this. And 
we'll call this 3D. This is often called a three-dimensional effect because the airflow data that I get is just 2D. But now because of this rotation, right, that there's this span-wise flow, there's kind of this three-dimensional behavior. We call this a three-dimensional effect. So the lift that I get is what I would have predicted in 2D plus some correction. So it's some function, we'll call it F sub L, and it's gonna depend on some things, right? Uh, uh, I'm actually not gonna write what they depend on, but well, C over R is one, often C over little r, sometimes R over R, other things, there are other parameters that are important, okay? But this is just some function, okay? So I'm actually just gonna say this is, this is some function here times, trying to distinguish between parentheses and functions here, times uh, CL from potential flow minus CL2D, right? So what that means is I'm just looking at the difference between, here's uh, CL alpha, right? Here's my CL2D, right? That's CL2D, whereas potential flow, as we've discussed, is gonna be this sort of straight line. In effect, the slope may be different too, but this is CL potential. And from thin airflow theory, we saw that it was two pi times alpha minus alpha zero. Although in many of these methods, we might just fit the data that we have in this port, the linear portion and use that instead because the slope should be very similar, but using a slope that's maybe from the data might be more accurate than using the two pi. But in any case, that's all that that is. So in other words, we're taking the difference between those two and you'll notice that that difference is gonna become much more enhanced. Maybe I should not have erased that. Let me draw it better then. Here's a CL2D and let's draw potential using the actual slope. Right here's CL potential. So the difference is gonna be zero during the linear region, but as I approach stall and especially post stall, this difference is more significant. And as we talked about when I'm kind of approaching stall or near stall when I'm velocity is gonna be much slower uh, over a bigger part of the airfoil, then this correction is significant, right? Whereas over here, there's no correction, okay? So uh, what does this term look like? Well, it depends. Um, there's a plethora of models. I'm just gonna write down one here, right? So this is like a modified Snell method. Has another name, I think, which I can't recall right now, but... Uh, Snell was the one who kind of first identified that this parameter was a critical one, the ratio of chord to rate, local chord to local radius. And then there's a, another correction said later that makes this work, especially as the uh, this ratio becomes smaller. This is like the, this is what we call a, uh, a modified tip speed ratio. It's like a tip speed ratio or it's kind of the inverse of that advanced ratio. It's similar to that. Anyway, it's the ratio of those velocities, right? Rotational velocity. In this case, it's an inflow velocity. So uh, this is just a correction term we could use. Again, important as I approach stall for sections of my propeller that are near stall, this 2D predicted behavior is uh, not correct. So I take this, I add this correction, and this is gonna extend my lift coefficient out further because that Coriolis effect is going to create that favorable pressure gradient. There are also drag models. Uh, I'm gonna tend to get an increase in drag. They're usually often of a similar form. You can find some in the book, but you can find many online in different publications. And I reference some in the book that you can look at. Mostly, I just want you to be aware that these exist and that you should uh, consider them if you want accurate data, <clears throat> especially if you have any part of your blade that's gonna be operating near stall, which is almost every wind turbine blade. Um, and even for propellers, perhaps not during your normal design cruise point, but during portions of the operation, if you wanna look at the you know, full flight profile, then certainly you're gonna have areas where this is important <clears throat> and it'll affect the prediction significantly. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about Reynolds and Mach number briefly. Uh, ideally, we just compute or have this data, right? So we can compute at a bunch of Reynolds numbers, a bunch of Mach numbers and create this big lookup table or spline. But if I don't have that, which is often the case, right? I've got some data. It's only a function of angle attack. I want to still account for Reynolds number and Mach number. So let me do Mach number first because we've talked about this before. It's pretty simple. Uh, one thing I could do is just use the Reynolds-Glauert expression. 
right? This is the primal Glauert. We derived this earlier in the semester. So all I do is I take what I would have computed, CL0, uh, incompressible, and I just divide by this factor, which before we called beta in our derivation. So this is going to uh, enhance my lift from compressibility. Again, this method is reasonable for moderate, low to moderately compressible, right? As I approach, say, 0.6 and higher, then this is probably not going to be particularly accurate. And I want to actually get data in that range or simulate with a compressible flow solver. But for mildly to moderately compressible flows, uh, this can work quite well. And it's easy to do, right? It's just one line. I should note that when we compute this Mach number, uh, W over the speed of sound, we would typically approximate W in this case because we haven't solved for the induction factors yet uh, as follows. And that the, the, the change by adding the induction would be very tiny for the purposes of this Mach number correction, which is already you know kind of a rough correction anyway. Same comment for Reynolds number. Okay, so for Reynolds number, uh, what we could do again, ideally maybe we've computed a different Reynolds numbers, but as long as we stay within the flow, same flow regime, right? So basically, uh, if it's already turbulent, it's still mostly, I mean, it was already mostly turbulent and we're changing within that or mostly laminar, we're changing within that. If we're significantly affecting our, our transition point, then, you know, we really should be computing those. But for example, we derived or, or well, the derived, we saw these expressions before for skin friction coefficient. This is for a laminar flow, just to be simple. For example, this is a flat plate. This was from the Blasius solution. So we can see that the drag is going to be proportional to one over the Reynolds number. Okay. So in other words, oops, sorry. My drag coefficient uh, at two different Reynolds numbers is going to be as follows, right? If I know my Reynolds number at which I computed my original data, and now that I have my new data, so I could write this this way. CD is equal to my original drag coefficient times Reynolds number to the P power, where P would be half, that'd be the square root for laminar, and for turbulent would be about 0.2. That 0.2 is the factor that we had from that Schlichting formula. You may have to go back and review that. But uh, again, the idea here is that for modest changes in Reynolds number, I just look at kind of the scaling, scaling laws of my uh, turbulent flow, and I see that it's going to vary with the Reynolds number. So if I've got my drag coefficient at a given Reynolds number, as I change it nearby Reynolds number, I can kind of predict about how much the drag is going to vary. Again, limitations there if I'm, again, near transition. Uh, but, you know, if I was in basically fully turbulent or close to fully turbulent, I'm changing Reynolds numbers, this should be a pretty good correction. Okay. Another consideration is extrapolation. I'm not going to write down a formula, but let me explain uh, uh, how this is going to look. Again, the reason why I mention this is important is that often, if I have data, it's going to be, whether it's simulation or wind tunnel data, it's generally going to be, I don't know, not much further than this. Maybe I potentially can get into a little bit of negative stall, but over some portions, I'm going to be operating over here, right, at high angles of attack, or during my solution process, I'm going to be over here and I've got no data. Uh, so we generally need to extrapolate. And although this sounds difficult, right? I need to calculate what's going to happen really high angles of attack. It's actually not too bad because what happens is, let's say I've got this airfoil here and, or I've got this other airfoil uh, that has this different shape, right? Once I get up to these really high angles, Uh, it almost doesn't really matter what the shape is anymore. It effectively is just this big flat plate, right? And there's going to be this big wake that's going to be occurring here. So as I'm approaching 90 degrees and I go past that all the way towards 180, um, this part, of course, is going to be affected tremendously by the shape. But after that, I get to these really high angles. The behavior is fairly universal and can be predicted from flat plate theory. So uh, there are, again, some minor adjustments that are made based on the actual data, like the drag and lift data that I have. So this is also applies to drag. I've been drawing lift here, but let's say I've got my drag coefficient. Same kind of idea. Uh, 
I can apply these extrapolations. And so I do my rotation. I'm going to apply an extrapolation. It's going to extend this out to higher angles, right? And it's going to have some sort of sinusoidal behavior. In this case, the drag is going to keep extending for a while. Um, may also have some sort of sinusoidal behavior as well. But uh, we expect this to be periodic, right? As I go from minus, I take the airflow and I go all the way from 180. Well, that's going to be the same as I go the other way. Once I get back to minus 180, I should get it the same value. So they're going to be these cosine and sine terms that you'll see. And there's some formulas in the book. Uh, I'll just write here that the Viterna is a popular uh, and relatively simple method to use. The one caveat I will add is that uh, although simple, once you add this with the rotation, um, these aren't always perfectly robust, especially depending on where your airflow data ends, because it could end in many different places. If you supply data here, a little bit post-stall, right at stall, sometimes you can get a little bit of funny behavior where these transition. Uh, so when you implement these, like when we have it, we have a bunch of checks and it's a little more robust, but even in that case, sometimes you can create some weird situations. So always a good idea to plot this first, right? You have your airflow data that you've already got, you apply a rotational correction, you apply an extrapolation, just plot it, look at it, uh, see if you need to make any adjustments on the data, you know, where you provide this cutoff, because sometimes you can get some weird behavior, right? Where maybe it has this dip and then another, I don't know, something weird that happens, right? And you don't want artificial behavior that you can you can get sometimes. All right, last thing, dynamic stall. Okay, and again, this, this could be a uh, huge, I mean, this is a big topic. Uh, we won't have time for that. But the idea is that, um, in fact, unsteady aerodynamics is, should be its own chapter. But uh, the idea is that the airfoil data that I get, if I'm just here at a static case measuring the angle of attack, is not the same if I come to that same angle of attack. I measure my lift to that same instantaneous angle of attack, but I'm approaching that dynamically. So let's say it's from a pitch motion or from a plunging motion, I'm moving. In any case, I'm moving or rotating in some manner. And at that instant in time, I'm at the same angle of attack, but my lift is not the same. And, uh, you know, this type of behavior is important for like hang glider pilots or, or uh, paragliders. If they're coming in for a landing, we can do a dynamic maneuver where we temporarily uh, increase the angle of attack to a really high one where statically we would um, quickly stop, but we can temporarily get a much higher lift so that you can approach the ground, kind of flare up, Get this temporary high lift and then you know really slow yourself down and hit the ground and you want to of course do that right because if you do it too early and you're too high then you really will stall and fall but if you can do it right you get a nice soft landing and insects or birds can do that too right you can see them come there's these cool pictures of an eagle right with kind of flaring out its wings and you get this really high angle of attack and you can land very softly right and that eagle can then use that to slow down and grab a mouse or whatever it's after in any case uh you know, what this looks like is really going to depend on where you're at uh, on, on, on this behavior. But say I go post stall, and let's just say I pick a point here. Uh, rather than having, uh, let me just draw this curve here. Statically, I might predict this blue behavior, and this is just some notional drawing. But dynamically, let's say I'm doing uh, this pitching motion where I'm pitching uh, my angle of attack some modest amount, right? Then I would get this kind of cyclic behavior uh, that that I would get from pitching where I, I don't get the static value, I get this this dynamic value. And here I'm doing the simple case where I'm just pitching. And if I'm uh, doing a pitch and a motion, all sorts of things, I get complicated behavior. I need to include a dynamic stall model. Again, we're not gonna talk about them. But this is just to note that if you wanna do an unsteady BEM, then these, these uh, dynamic stall models are important. If you wanna do just a steady case saying, I wanna know my thrust and torque are um, in a time average sense, right? Or um, with cruise conditions, right? Where conditions are steady, then you don't need a dynamic stall model. But if I wanna do a maneuver or say I'm, I've got this propeller and I'm moving relatively quickly relative to my rotation speeds or velocities, then I need to include this type of model. Okay, so to summarize, there are a bunch of things that, that can affect your airflow data. And again, remember mm -hmm. airflow data, super important. That's the most important thing to get right. In almost all cases, we need to apply rotational corrections and extrapolations. Sometimes for propellers, if you're looking only really at simple cases, you don't really care about 
any off design conditions, then maybe you can get away without, without doing those. But most of the time we need to at least some modest rotation or stall is gonna occur. We need rotational corrections. We need extrapolation. Reynolds number, Mach number, often again, it's better to clip that data. But if you can't, even these simple corrections can, can be helpful. And then if you wanna look at unsteady behavior, then you need to incorporate a dynamic stall model. Okay, so that's it for bladal momentum. That's gonna wrap up that chapter. Um, in the book, I also have some discussion about wake models, uh, which are especially important for wind turbines, but uh, we won't be discussing that here. It's kind of a separate topic, just kind of a bonus area there. Okay, so that's the last thing we discussed in the class in terms of a, a code that we implemented was this bladal momentum model. There's various data out there, various codes. We have our own code, CC Blade on the website. You can look at and compare to if you want to implement one and, and see how you're doing. And there are various publications with data as well. All right, have a good one.